Hello and welcome to today's webinar from the IRFU on how to run a touch rugby competition in your club or school. My name is David Keane and today we'll be going through the different ways about touch rugby and about the different ways in which you can actually run a touch rugby competition in um, your club or your school. So the IRFU, this is part of a wider range of webinars series and it is providing resources for clubs and schools to be able to use as uh, government restrictions north and south ease. So the COVID team in the IRFU will provide full communication to clubs and schools as things change in the coming weeks and months as well. So this webinar is obviously trying to prepare clubs and schools to be able to produce uh, different aspects um, within, the, within the health guidelines as well. I am delighted to be joined uh, with, here today with Billy Naguini uh, from the Ireland Touch Association. The IRFU and the Ireland Touch Association are working together, uh, collaborating together to produce resources for the game of touch rugby. And we're delighted to have Billy here with us. Billy is highly experienced in touch rugby, but also in rugby itself as a former Sevens player for Italy and has played the highest level of touch rugby for Ireland and for New Zealand as well. Billy, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, cheers, Derek. Thanks for having me. So Billy, um, just to, to, to start off with, I suppose, for our participants today is, is the first question I'd ask you, I suppose, is what is touch rugby? But I'd say a lot of people are would have been over the last number of years been used to the game of tip rugby as something maybe that they would have played before um, before training. So what is touch rugby? And I suppose maybe if you could just give us explain the difference between the two. Yep, sure. Um, so touch is a, a adaptation of rugby league, the 13 man game. Um, it's half the pitch size. Uh, it also uses half the players. So it's only six v six on a um, 50 by 70 meter pitch. Um, the the main thing is that it's it's minimal contact, and I emphasise the minimal part. It's now a game that's been attached to rugby organisations like New Zealand, um, South Africa, and England to develop their their rugby players. Um, but at the core. Uh, it's an all-inclusive game, uh, family-friendly game. Uh, it's versatile, so it suits uh, all levels of playing abilities. Um, it's not biased, so it's not um, uh, biased to size, uh, your physical strength or the sex of the athlete, but rather heavily dependent on skill and tactical and strategic uh, thinking. Um, so one of the big things between touch and tip uh, is the rules. So. Touch has worldwide recognised rules um, that are set out and uh, tip rules tend to differ week by week, club by club and country uh, as well. So if you learn the specific version of touch, um, no matter where you go, whether it's a different club or different uh, or different country, um, you're, you're able gonna, uh, to play the game straight away. Um, the other thing is, uh, and which is something that's quite big in regards to the differences, is touch has representative honours. So you're, you're able to represent your country, you're able to play in European tournaments. Um, most countries, definitely the rugby uh, playing nations, have rep teams. So there are European tournaments, there are international tournaments such as the, the Youth World Cup and the Senior World Cup. Um, and you can represent your country as young as under 15s and you're still capable as um, to, to play for Ireland at the age of you know, in your your twilight years. Um, so that's the master's grade, which are the over 50. So touch provides um, all levels of, of um, grading to allow anyone to slot into whatever age group and to be able to uh, represent, you know, uh, your country. That's brilliant, uh, Billy. Thanks a million. Um, Billy, I suppose if you, were, if you were to say to a club, you know, what kind of benefits do you think like uh, touch rugby could bring into a club? Um, I think that the best thing is, uh, and especially because of the, the versatile part of the game and how a caters for shapes and sizes, is you're able to get um, all members, regardless of whether they're there to support or even there just to play, uh, and the age groups, that you're able to mix the age groups um, between each other. Because it's emphasized, the minimal contact is a, a huge emphasis, um, that's an important factor for inclusion. So you might have players who are physically bigger or even older, um, but they're capable because of their specific rule to, to play in teams with younger students or younger players. Uh, you also have the opportunity to be able to play um, with your parents um, or older members who have been part of the club. 
you know, so that in terms of it's it's probably one of the most inclusive sports. Um, and obviously to take into consideration is the, uh, it's it's knowing who you can play with based on their, their skill sets um, rather than their physical attributes. Uh, I guess the other thing it caters for is all fitness levels because of the um, the ability to have unlimited substitutions. You can sub on whenever you want. Um, and and if you you know and or you can stay on longer just to push your fitness levels um and i think the best thing probably and the easiest thing and especially in this time uh something to look forward to is the fact that uh, it's an easy setup you know you only need uh, a little bit of information uh, sorry a little bit of, of of equipment in order to set up your pitch so it's just a few markers whether it's shoes or or cones to mark out your pitch and the ball you know and you're away yeah, like I mean, I think the big thing that you you sort of emphasise there, Billy, is the fact that it's fun. It's really good fun, and I suppose this is the reason why we're putting on these webinars as well, is to is to create these resources for clubs to actually bring fun back in when we're allowed to do that and get people put smile on people's faces. And you also you also mentioned the different ages there. Like it's incredible to think that you have. You know, under 14s, for example, playing in in Wanderers touch rugby, all the way up to a 71 year old who plays for De La Salle, uh, touch rugby in De La Salle. So, like, you know, it's 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 a game for all ages, as you said. It's a game for different um, fitness levels as well. Can I just bring you into, I suppose, the the skill development and and maybe you know what some people might say is it can be quite a structured game. But I suppose, you know, can you sort of give us a, a kind of outline of some of the skills that are transferable, but also outline in terms of break down those myths of, oh, it's a very sort of structured game. It's it's a game that can be played for, you know, in all different ways. Yeah. Um, so I think one of the important things to, to understand is depending on the level that you are playing at can determine the type of, ben uh, type of benefits or the amount of benefits that you can gain from the game. But no matter what level you're playing at, um, you, you are always going to improve your ability to pass, catch, uh, catch the ball accurately uh, because of the amount of times you're executing the skill uh, within the game. Like it's, I know with rugby, we tend to have skill drills or skill based games uh, on the side to try and pick up uh, the amount of time we're able to use those specific skills. Whereas with touch, because we can't, we don't have the rule of kicking um, and we can't kick ourselves out of trouble and or to try and gain territory, we are heavily reliant on the passing ability and accuracy of catching in order to sort of maintain the ball and maintain position to work your way up the pitch. The other thing it looks at is footwork, uh, footwork, line running and timing. Um, and that's because of the rule, uh, the rule of that's around touch. So what deems a touch and a touch is uh, the contact between a, uh, a defensive player and the um, ball carrier. So that's as minimal as a fingertip on the ball or a fingertip like touching someone's sock. So there's a lot of honesty involved. But if that's the case, if it's that hard to um, uh, beat a player as opposed to um, uh, rugby, as opposed to 15s and tag where you've got uh, you've got to tackle someone, you've got to pull off um, pull off the tag, which is a uh, high difficulty level anyway. There's more emphasis on the um, more advantage towards the attacking team for those games. Whereas in touch, because it's so easy to make the touch, you, you are you have to put pressure on your ability to run lines, your ability to catch the ball and pass the ball into space and find space in order to break the line. Um, I think the other thing that's so beneficial about touch is, like I said before, about us trying to um, rugby players or rugby coaches trying to create these these situations where you can use your two v ones or um, 3v2s like touch repetitively has these situations and it happens after every single touch is made so once a touch is made that person is deemed offside until they retreat the, to the defensive line so they can't interrupt play whatsoever so it gives the opportunity that as soon as a touch is made you'll automatically have an overlap somewhere so um you, you if you can imagine the amount of times a touch is made within the game and the amount of times you're going to come across this specific skill uh it outweighs the amount of time we actually have in a training session to be able to set up your 3v2s um and the last thing that you mentioned in regards to the the structured side there is structure within touch and the structure is similar to how we we run um the 15s game so you have your you have the ability to have a structured um 
exit sets and then you have your ability to have um, your strike plays and things like that. But I, I think one of the things you're going to get out of touch is uh, every time a touch is made is you can look at it as being your, your launch play um, or your strike play. And once you get used to the game, all you do is tend to flick through all the, the plays that you have in your heads and then you sort of pick, depending on what the defense is doing, you're able to react. So um, it's it's less a look structured, but when you actually start playing the game and when you start breaking it down, it's very unstructured, it's very expensive. And a lot of that uh, ability to be expensive is determined by um, your coaching style and probably the uh, ability of your players, and that's it. Yeah, and I, and I think when you talk about it being unstructured, it's more about creating that skill for the players to be able to identify space and to be able to exploit that. And that, and that really improves, you know, the player's decision making. Like, you know, touch rugby worldwide has been proven to, you know, improve skill levels and obviously create a pathway as well. One of the things I just wanted, I suppose, because one of the difference between, you know, touch rugby and tip rugby, for example, maybe Billy just mentioned, I suppose, would be the initiating the touch, which for a lot of people, if you're playing, if you're used to playing tip rugby, why would the attackers initiate the touch? And, and, and just just maybe give us a quick answer around that before we show uh, people a couple of videos as well, is why you do that and, and the opportunities that that creates. Well, one of the benefits of that is it obviously gives more advantage to the attacking team. So it allows the attacking team to create momentum and play behind the line. Um, it's something we do in rugby as well. So uh, when we're trying to speed up play, um, there isn't a lot of wrestling, uh, wrestling in the ruck. We're usually trying to take that tackle quickly, uh, place the ball back and play off that ruck. And it's a similar uh, context that we use for touch. It's making that touch and initiating the touch so we can try and catch the defensive team offside. So what it also uh, makes sure that the, the attacking team has to do is to stay on the ball the whole time. Yeah, that's brilliant, Billy. And, and just to let everyone know is as well is is next week, next Thursday, we will be having a, another webinar in terms of an introduction to to touch rugby coaching, um, which would be very useful for you know coaches that are obviously may want to introduce that into the club, but also as well as how you can actually you know with the restrictions hopefully easing in the next weeks and months that you can actually introduce that into part of your training regime where you add a bit of fun. Uh, competitive game element within that as well. And um, so if maybe we just show you a couple of uh, video clips before I move on to Justin Deegan and around the structure around fixtures and everything. So maybe uh, Colin, could you just throw up maybe a couple of videos and, and Billy, you could sort of talk us over uh, of this. So the videos that are going to go up now are based on the um, the Irish winning European side for the over 30s mixed team. So one of the things I really wanted to point out was the ability for this side to, they play a lot of heads up um, touch. Um, they have a lot of ex international rugby players and representative players. Um, the, the other thing you're gonna see in these clips is also the emphasis on uh, no matter who you are or what you are in your rugby life, you're gonna have um, like a, the mixed game, obviously the girls there. So it's the uh, emphasis on team and um, uh, team inclusion so you, as you see there, one of our ball players is Tanya Rossa, um, who's the next international women's player for the 15 side. Uh, she's, and if you know Tanya, you know that she will command the game. Um, but the, the good thing about touch is the fact that because it's not based on your physical attributes or your size, people like Tanya, who are a little bit smaller than most of the boys, are able to compete. I think just on that point, Billy, as well, is, is like it's, it, why it's so good is that the fact that it's it, it's open to everybody. Uh, it, it doesn't matter what shape or size you are, you know, everyone can play the game. And I think that's what makes it so inclusive, you know, and, and we talk about sort of, you know, clubs and schools, it's to try and get everyone in playing our form of the game. Yeah, and so even for this clip that's up here is, um, with the specific side, they tend to call things um, just what they see in front of them, as opposed to sort of setting up three or four phase plays. Um, and a lot of the time, I think the benefit of sort of having players develop that in touch, because in rugby, you only have the ball for a certain amount of time. If you try and explore certain um, uh, plays and if they don't come off, there is a bit of time before you get the ball back. Within touch, you can be a bit more adventurous. If you make a mistake, there isn't too long. It's about a minute or so to a set to be finished before you get another crack at it. 
Thanks a million, Billy. That's that's fantastic. Um, so yeah, so thanks a million, Billy. So the next next uh, presenter I'm going to bring in here. We just finished this this clip. Let me show the ability there. Very good. Excellent. Thanks a million for that. Now, um, so the next presenter we're going to bring in is Justin Deegan. Justin Deegan is very experienced in the participation uh, de department and um, has had wide range of experience in terms of um, sort of Olympic qualifiers for sevens um, world sevens qualifiers, the Union Cup a couple of years ago as well. So has huge experience in the you know, the creation of, of fixtures. So Justin, uh, thanks very much for joining us. So maybe you could just give us a, a basics in terms of what a club can can do in terms of creating that template for fixtures. Thanks, Dave. Cheers. Um, yeah, my, my, my big mantra is um, rigidity around structures because that's what the, the teams enjoy. They enjoy the predictable nature of, of um, when their games are and uh, how enjoyable their groups are going to be. They trust you in in providing this. So I'm just going to share a um, presentation here. Uh, that should be showing now. Um, so I've, I've got some considerations that we think of when we uh, are putting a league together or even a one day event. Uh, the, the value. So a, a team, a team is paying money here. You know that they're, they're they're adding to the numbers. They're very valuable people. So we give them a game every week, no matter what what uh, level they are and what level uh, they finish up in a table. Um, we we have to be fair before all this. We have to put them in. We have to put them in a, a group with teams of similar ability. So if we can't identify an initial grouping, we have to uh, crowbar in a little stage for. For grading here, so um, if we, if uh, if we can fit one night of grading, that's not too bad. If we can fit three weeks in a, in a seven week league, which is my ideal um, uh, length of a, of a league, that would be even better. So um, and then the punctuality side of things, the having the schedules out, the results and tables updated. Um, like again, I I always try to think like the team that's taken part. So they need to be able to. Um, they, they're going to be want. They're going to want to be able to see their table the next morning, or even that night. Uh, they're going to want to see who they're playing next week and how that team has done so far as well. So, you know, it, it's a uh, the punctuality of that. It, it adds to to the professionalism of how the league is run. And adaptability. Just listen. Listen to the team. The captain's requests for for times. You know, not everyone can make a certain time. So we you you, you try to um, to accommodate everyone as much as possible. And then the duration of the the league or event is very important. I I do think the ideal length for uh, any any uh, multi team um, uh, league or competition or uh, event is um, seven weeks. And um, especially if you've got uh, eight teams, which is your your ideal busy kind of venue. So, uh, what what I do to help compose um, fixtures is I, ha I we we do a sketch, and the sketch is basically I start with the three team sketch just to show you how how the thinking behind it is. So I, I need all the ones, all the all the teams that team one is going to play is uh, number two and number three there, and then um, two is got, has to play number three as well. So it's it's kind of a inverted pyramid here. Uh, so for for four teams, the the same kind of uh, formula in putting this little checklist together, and that that's all this is. It's, it's really a checklist. So um, what you do is you 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 scratch off the games as you put them into. Um, uh, your your structure, and the reason I'm I'm showing you this as opposed to the two documents that we'll distribute at the end of uh, or when the recording of this um, webinar is sent out. The reason I'm showing you this is because there might be times when you have to do this kind of stuff um, on the spot. So you, you could do this off the back of your hand and um, just just keep to this kind of. Uh, Way of thinking, and you, you you won't miss a game. You won't double up on anything, and uh, it, it's much easier. You're much more confident in uh, being able to patch up uh, changeables. You know, we can't control everything. So the example schedules here. Uh, I have um, a document where 
we we have tabs here for formulas for each uh, eventuality. So um, I wouldn't put in a 12 team there because you know it's three times four. So basically the example venue that I'm going to use is um, a league with 12 teams. So three groups of uh, four looks like um, this. This is the, the um, fixtures for four. And I, I apply this into an overall structured document. So for, for a seven week league with 12 teams, we've already got, we only need three pitches for two time slots. Uh, if, that, if that's the amount of time slots we want to do. So um, with three grading rounds, um, you'll see here, I keep pointing, um, you'll see here we've three weeks of grading. So we've um, groups um, divided. And we have the stronger teams that we know of spread across the three groups. And then those um, three groups are going to finish after week three and their tables are going to determine what next group they go into. So uh, you have championship, conference one and conference two. Uh, this is just the way this venue worked out that we had um, four stronger teams and then eight not up to that level. So it was um, easy enough. Um, so we have uh, th this is like the first grouping stage here on, on the, the first group of grading on the top. They played accordingly here and then um, the, the teams were reallocated into this is the higher the higher grades um, uh, fixtures. So just to to show that this this is a way of being able to retrospectively change should we need to change anything but it's a really good start and it's really good for referee allocation for time allocation especially when you get a time request in that adaptability part that we talked about earlier so um yeah that that's that's um two documents we're going to send out and it should really help it'll help you with anything you run in your club anyway but um for for a touch this is a great way to start and um we're, we're always around for uh, assistance. If if you need if you need any advice on anything, you can just email us at touch at irfu.ie. So that's that's all that presentation there, Dave. Thanks a million, Justin. Um, and I suppose one of the main things, I suppose, the reason why Justin talks about the grading is because we want people to have fun. So if you're running a competition within your club, you know the grading is there to basically put in place where people will end up you know, playing at the same level that, you know, that they want to play rather than, you know, putting themselves in a position where they could be playing against a much stronger team every week, which which ends up not being enjoyable. So that's the reason why we, we, we put those things in place. Thanks a million for that, Justin. That was very, um, very informative. And just to let you know, we'll obviously be we emailing you out all those templates as well. So you'll have those plus the um, the recording of this webinar as well for your own for your own use as well. So next, I'd like to bring in Aidan Carney. Aidan Carney, for probably those of you around for a long time in rugby, will know is a former uh, Ulster and Leinster player, played for the Ireland under 21s, but has been a staff member and a, and a valuable member of the participation team for the last number of years, and has huge experience in running events for obviously the IRFU, but also within his own club, Setonians. Um, RFC as well. So Aidan, maybe you'd like to just give us um, some sort of sort of background, I suppose, to you know the venue manager and what participants probably need to have in place um, for running an event. Uh, thanks, Dave. Yes, and good afternoon, everybody. I am looking at the um, just as, as Dave said, the, the venue manager uh, uh, and what goes on behind the scenes in the lead up to your uh, events. Today we're going to look at three aspects, your pre-event, um, your event, and then your post-event. But before all that, uh, it's always good to have a welcome note for your teams um, and, and get off on the right foot. Um, some of the information that you, you know captains and teams would need would be the outline of the tournaments so they know what to expect. Uh, week on week, um, i.e. grading as Justin has alluded to. Some links to the website, where to go to get your fixtures, where to go to get your uh, law book, uh, and where to go potentially to, to um, for your timings. Uh, also, you know, in that should be your, your uh, up-to-date COVID-19 guidelines, uh, 
the obvious one here, you know, your venue location for brand new players um, and your site map, uh, which would have your, your pitch layout, uh, your team designated areas and where your check-in desk is. And also it's important to send out information on facilities, you know, uh, toilets, both male and female, uh, shop, is your, um, is their shop open or closed? That sort of, um, that sort of stuff. Um, so, look, your pre-event is really is what required into the lead up to your events. Um, a lot of this is common sense. Um, you arrive early, uh, get your pitches marked, get your check-in desk set up. And again, this is really just so, you know, an hour prior to kickoff, you can kind of sit back and if there is any issues, uh, for instance, a referee may be late or uh, a team doesn't arrive, it gives you time to, to work around that. Uh, your pitch setup, if you have numbers for your pitches, great. Make sure they're clearly marked. Um, also, in this current uh, climate is your, your team designated area. If you have multiple rounds, uh, we like to split up our teams um, as opposed to everyone congregating on one side of the pitch. It's to have everyone um, spread out and uh, two meters apart as we're all uh, well known at this and we're well versed at this stage. Um, your team check-in, uh, again, it's to get your the captain to get their team sheets uh, and also the important one here is the uh, player declarations uh, it's just making sure that people who are arriving uh, have declared that they are healthy to play uh, and again your referee appointments uh, get them out uh, get them out early uh, making sure that uh, referees are available and that they know at what time they're going to play at um, the event itself um, it's look, you're just overseeing your event. You're making sure it's running smoothly and on time. I think timing is the key here. Um, making sure that if you're going off a central timer, that everything starts on time. Uh, in, in, in the case that you have multiple rounds, uh, and again, where light is, um, where light may be an issue, you know, depending on if you're coming into the summer, the end of the summer, or in towards autumn. Uh, making sure your first dater, uh, whoever that person is, is there before kickoff. And again, it's always good to know uh, if there is any other um, first daters qualified, whether it be a fireman, an ambulance person, um, in, in playing or refereeing. Uh, it's always good to know. Uh, volunteer support is 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 an important one here. Uh, you, you know, events can't run on their own, uh, and club volunteers are, are very important. Um, and again, it's any issues that may arise. Um, if teams aren't, you know, uh, if teams aren't behaving, if if you know, especially with with the COVID uh, uh, guidelines, it's it's you know to deal with these firmly, fairly, and make sure resolutions are found. Um, and again, it's always good to reward, uh, you know, your volunteer for for the help that they are giving you. Um, your post events, so when everything is um, packed away and and, and and people are are have gone home or gone to the bar, um, it's again it's confirming results. It's checking, you know, the checking in with referees. Um, to see if there's any issues, uh, publishing those results uh, because people like to have the information to hand, uh, where they're situated on the league and how other teams are getting on. Uh, disciplinary issues, um, really these, it's, it's to get your reports from the referee, offer captains, um, you know, to share their side of the story. Um, and again, it's to, it's to decide on sanction and communicate it with the captains well in advance of the next game so everybody knows uh, where they stand and again another important one here and another one for i suppose building relationships with your teams um it's to get feedback from captains on how the, how the nights are going um and again it's really to review review your events and, and always look to improve that's great thanks a million uh Ado. That's fantastic. So that obviously gives you a, a kind of a, an insight into the sort of the needs um, of running an event. Uh, and, and there is quite a lot of it. And as well as just, you know, everyone should be sort of up to date, I suppose, with the, the COVID guidelines and, and working with that um, COVID officer to make sure that the event is is obviously run within a safe, uh, safe environment as well. I'm just going to come on to a couple of questions that have, have, have come through with us. The first, obviously, I'm going to answer, answer myself and it's around uh, what are the insurance implications for the club is. 
So the RFU are covering insurance for the summer, but each club should have their own uh, insurance for their grounds anyway as well. So, you know, so there isn't, you know, as long as your club is up to date with their own insurance policy that they would have in place anyway, then, you know, from a touch point of view, then there's, there's no issue there at all. I'm going to ask um, just Billy, bring Billy back in here. Um, Billy, one of the questions I suppose we've asked, they've asked is from, a, from an age point of view, is there restrictions around age? So basically, Billy, maybe you could give us a, an answer to that one. Yeah, no, there's no restriction around age um, in regards to minis. Um, like you can mingle and you can mix some of the age groups there um, with some of the players that are with some of the uh, the kids and stuff in the under 10s, under 12s, upwards, they're able to jump about two to three years. A, a lot of it just comes down to common sense um, on trying to mix the, the groups together. Uh, but mostly just from as young as the minis, they can play touch, the pitch will be a little bit modified, but the, the rest of the players, um, the older groups from the youth players, um, a lot of those age groups can be mixed together. Thanks a million, Billy. And, and one one final question for you as well is just around that we 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 um we were asked in terms of of the need for a referee within that. Um, and I suppose it brings it back to your point around uh, honesty. And you know that if if you don't have a qualified touch referee, obviously that adds uh, hugely to it. And again, what we what we the IRFU will be doing will be creating these modules for clubs around playing, coaching, refereeing, etc. But maybe just have a word about the sort of the honesty element of that and the ability for teams to, you know, to, to go out and play as long as it's played within the, the rules of the game. Yeah, the big thing about touch is the fact that everything's in front of you. Um, there's no sort of rucks where there's a bit of that black magic that's going around and, you know, with guys and that sort of that, those uh, hidden tricks of the trade. I'm sure Aiden has probably used a few of those. Um, but everything is in front of you. It's it's pretty hard to be dishonest in, instead of um, calling the touch and stuff. Guys will feel it. People will know, you know. So it's at the honesty level is uh, you would have to be quite blatant and it would have to be very hard to um, to not sort of to get away with stuff. It just it doesn't really work that way. Um, so if your teeth, if the players are honest, um, you don't need a referee. Uh, in order to someone physically there. But obviously when it comes to the really competitive games um, where the honesty line is a bit blurry, um, it, you, probably, you might need someone then. Yeah, thanks a million. Um, thanks a million for that, Billy. And, and thanks thanks for all your, your input as well. Um, so that basically comes to the, the end of our, um, our webinar today. We hope you've enjoyed it. I suppose just to give you a kind of uh, an update on some of the webinars that we have coming up next Monday, uh, March the 29th at one o'clock, we have a webinar which deals with making your club an amenity for your community, uh, which would be very, very interesting. And we have some really interesting case studies from different clubs of uh, things that they've used that actually worked. And um, obviously, as I mentioned earlier on in, in, in this webinar as well, next Thursday, we'll have an introductory to introduction to Touch Rugby Coaching and, and Billy will be back again. And what that will, will cover will be uh, sessions that sort of coaches can introduce into their own 15 aside and um, sevens or 10 aside training sessions but again it's adding that once the restrictions start to ease that we can add in that uh, competitive kind of game element of it as well and, and, and fun and um, for those of you uh, who are administrators um, on April Tuesday April the 6th um, Ireland Sevens Captain Lucy Mullahall, who's an expert in this area, will be dealing with Rugby Connect. It's a refresher for administrators, so that will be in posted as well. And for those of you who are more interested in touch rugby as well, is the Ireland Touch Association, uh, as I said to you, is a uh, proud partner with the IRFU and collaborating together to, to grow this game in the four provinces as well. Their website is www.irelandtouch.ie as well. So they have more inf information on their on their um, their association as well. So listen, before we just go, uh, thank you to our presenters, Billy Naguini from the Ireland Touch Association, Justin Deegan and Aidan Carney from the RFU Participation and behind the scenes, uh, Orla Fulham-Smith and Colin Finnegan, thank you for all your help. Really hope you've enjoyed this and it's given you a little bit of uh, a, an idea in terms of maybe getting something up and running once the, uh, the government restrictions allow it as well. So thanks very much and enjoy the rest of your day.